Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Anne Franca, the Chief Executive of the Chartered Management Institute, CMI, and I'm delighted to announce the launch of our new series, The Leading Issue. In these series of informal conversations, I'll be talking with leaders across the private and public sector about the management and leadership issues of the day that really matter to them. I'll also be finding out a little bit more about the way in which they lead, what's keeping them awake at night, what they're excited about, and where they think management and leadership is headed in the future. In the leading issue, we'll also be probing many of the questions that I cover in my Times Enterprise Network column, where managers and leaders submit the issues that they want to know about. And I'll be using these conversations with leaders to get their take on what are the issues that are bothering them today. I hope you'll join me for this first episode where I'm absolutely thrilled to share a conversation I had with Dame Sharon White, the chairman of the John Lewis Partnership. Sharon is our gold medal winner for 2022, and she was generous enough to share her insights around International Women's Day and apprenticeships about what leaders of the future really should look like. And I'm also delighted to say that we will once again be putting on CMI's Women's Conference, May 16th. It's back by popular demand. Please do join us to probe many interesting issues of the day with a variety of fabulous speakers. And you can sign up in the link on the Eventbrite and in the chat. So once again, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome to you to this inaugural episode, and I really hope you enjoy it. It's my absolute pleasure uh, to welcome now, please, um, to uh, this wonderful event, our gold medal winner of 2022, Dame Sharon White. Sharon became the John Lewis Partnership's sixth chairman in February 2020. Before this, she spent a number of years in the public sector, including roles at the Treasury, the World Bank, and the Prime Minister's Policy Unit, and prior to her current role, was Chief Executive of Ofcom, the UK's communications regulator. Um, this inspirational career has been recognized not only by the 2022 CMI Gold Medal, but also she um, was recognized in the New Year's Honors List for her dedication to public service, and she's also very recently been named Britain's most influential black person in the Power List 2023. Dame Sharon, welcome. Lovely to see you and thank you so much for joining very, us. Um, it's brilliant to uh, <laughs> I managed to slip in early, so it's great actually just to um, sort of be incredibly inspired by both the apprentices but then also the employer panel. So it's great to see you. Thank you oh, so much brilliant. for inviting me tonight. And well, I'm so glad you could make it. And you saw you had one of your wonderful apprentices, yeah, so Julia. Julia. Yes. It's fantastic. Uh, which is a great story. But um, Tell me, what do you think, what's the role of apprenticeships for you um, in training the workforce of the future? And, you know, where does it fit in for you in that training menu? Yeah, it's a big question. I um, was very struck by Heather's comment sort of linking rightly apprentices and um, apprenticeships and social mobility. And we use these very big terms, but it's really about how everybody can, can get held. And obviously, some of you will know the, the John Lewis partnership is, as I said, is this sort of extraordinary and very um, particular background in that it was basically set up as, a, as an engine for social mobility um, with the idea that essentially you'd have a business that almost provides the sorts of benefits and opportunities, um, almost like the welfare state before the welfare state was set up. So for us, apprenticeships are the most fantastic sort of modern um, route by which we can really support everybody to move from being a um, brilliant shop assistant when you go into Waitrose or uh, John Lewis um, uh, at the checkout, right the way through to being a branch manager or then, you know, becoming a buyer or some of the more sort of senior, senior roles. So we've got about three and a half thousand apprentices since um, 2016 and they are absolutely core cool, um, to, to, our, to our pipeline of talent. 
that's great to see. And you mentioned um, social mobility. And um, we looked at that as part of our Everyone Economy research uh, last um, year for our 75th anniversary. And, um, and actually we found it's really important for organizations to do this, but there's quite a big say-do gap. A lot of them say they do stuff for social mobility, but they don't actually do do stuff for social mobility, and they don't really have any for recruitment programs, et cetera. Um, why do you think um, that's important that we focus, that businesses focus on socio-economic um, mobility, and how best do they do that? Um, so we've just been talking about hospitality being a sort of amazing sector for, um, uh, for, for, for kind of progression of mobility. And I think retail is the other mm -hmm. sort of enormously important um, sector with the biggest employer of any across the country. And it is an area where you can come in with no qualifications and, um, you know, move from working in a supermarket and working your way up. So I think, for, certainly for my business, social mobility is absolutely kind of endemic and core to what we are, um, what we are trying to do. I think it's also when we talk about inclusion, it's the kind of class is the last sort of frontier. And, um, you know, we, in the current context that we've just been talking about, the biggest cost of living crisis um, since the 1970s, there's a macroeconomy um, background, which is probably as adverse as any of us have known since, you know, the financial crisis. So how do we ensure that our young people who have got fewer networks, um, have got fewer opportunities in those sort of soft areas, have got just the same opportunities as um, those who are better connected. So it's, it's a moral right, but it's also um, a very, very strong sort of business um, exigency too. Yes. And you, were, you said, uh, that I'm struck by this term that John Lewis was set up as the original social yeah. mobility engine. And, and how does that reflect in, for example, your recruitment practices? You know, how do you tap into those talent pools um, that you might not otherwise tap into? And, and, and do apprenticeships play a role in that? Yeah, so I mean, some of you will, I mean, Judy, you've had a great example. We have got um, now a very particular focus on young people leaving the care system. Mm -hmm. Um, so we've been thinking about where do we, where can we kind of really add value? Where can we really add the weight of the, of the, of the brand in terms of employment? And everybody will know young people from the care system three times as likely, three, four times as likely to be um, out of any kind of economic activity, even as compared to young, other young people, more likely to be homeless um, than to be at university. And so we are really trying to sort of focus um, our efforts on this very um, sort of incredibly fractured but also very under discussed group. So we've set up um, an apprenticeship program specifically for young people coming out of the care system. We were, it's a shame, um, I mean, Gillian, who I think is, um, is already making a huge impact, but the, 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 the announcement last week, the response to the um, McAllister report for, for care leavers, the fact that if you're an apprentice, apprentice coming from the care system, you're now getting double the um, amount of support, double the amount of levy. So in our own, in our own small way, we are really trying to focus on probably the most um, economically and socially and almost immediately sort of disadvantaged group ooh, through, our, um, through, our, through our apprenticeship programme. I think that's great. And of course, we all know and we're inspired by um, uh, your wonderful uh, Christmas ad, um, again, featuring the, the, the skateboarding father who was taking in um, uh, the, the young person who was in a care home. Why do you think it's so important for business to focus on social purpose? And, you know, what role does that play for you? For What should businesses be doing? Yeah, I mean, it's... Um I mean, it is fascinating because there's now no business that doesn't talk about purpose. And I think, um, which, I, which I think is an enormous positive, something that's become obviously much more attenuated um, through COVID when businesses, all of us, have just been sort of reappraising what matters in life? Who do I want to work for? What kind of work-life 
balance do I want? You know, who do I want to shop with? Where do I want to put my money? What's, what's really important between um, consuming today and ensuring that the planet is safe tomorrow? And so all of those issues, I think, have just become a, 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 a sort of tremendous crescendo. And, um, and certainly for us, we know that, um, that people are much more likely to um, shop with, to want to work with businesses that kind of stand for something. Mm -hmm. And you know, certainly over the last couple of years when I've been doing recruitment, we've just done a kind of big revamped purpose in the partnership around kind of happiness. And um, happiness, happiness, but that's why it was founded, right? Happiness, happiness, yeah. Yeah. working yeah, in partnership for a happy world. And yeah. um, you know, many of the which is now kind of at the front of all our recruitment, and many of the um, you know, people I've talked to, partners coming into the partnership, have said, Actually, the first thing we did was to Google purpose because we what kind of you know, whether we're coming in for an entry level job or you know, uh, um, you know, more senior in your career, actually, we want to figure out whether my values as a person align with the values of this company. And so I think it's not a sort of, it's not a nice to have. I think you cannot be a business that's going to be commercially successful, but also to have, um, you know, to hire and retain brilliant people, um, unless you stand for something that's more than about making money. And for us constitutionally, you know, our job is to make enough money, sufficient profit to, to fulfill our purpose. Now, it has to be said we're not making enough money at the moment because, <laughs> you know, the macro situation has been, has been super tough. But, sure. um, yeah, we've, we've got a very different balance as a business between profit and purpose. Well, and, you know, that is proven. I know um, CMI's own research and I know that John Lewis, has, uh, Spadan Lewis, I think, was founded on this. Happier people are more productive, right? And, and your, your point, you said um, businesses need to um, make sure that, the, that their values and align with the personal values of their employees and employees want their personal values to align with the business. And that's been proven to lead to better results, actually. So there's a purpose to purpose. Yeah, I mean, it's... Um yeah, as I say, I mean, I find this sort of debate slightly, slightly a non-debate. Um, <laughs> you know, there's been lots of criticism about sort of, you know, so-called woke kind of capitalism, which I kind of think about as common sense capitalism. It's not a choice. You know, you cannot, you cannot be operating in business without having a clear, a clear purpose. I mean, fascinating this week with, um, with BP announcing um record results which is you know which is great for them and all the debate has been about actually where is the company in relation to its climate change targets and there's no company in whatever sector you are you know business is 50 percent of the economy what are we doing to improve social impact what are we doing to ensure that we're still here as a as a, a planet. as a planet <laughs> it's it, it is i think it is something that is becoming more top of mind and interestingly and i think rightly what you're saying is businesses are going to be held more to account um, and if they do just make profits that seem at odds with their purpose then that's going to get called out not only perhaps by the media but what i think you're saying is by their own employees um, and by their future employees yeah i yeah, completely. I think it's um, and their I th customers. I th I think it's just a a necessity of doing great business. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, and again, you know, you have been at the forefront of that, and I think that um, uh, that is an incredibly important point. And the 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 big thing is, which is what you're saying, is it's not a debate. It's common sense capitalism. It's right. It's common sense capitalism. Brilliant. I love that line. Um, I'm going to turn slightly now to um, uh, this event is a little bit early for International Women's Day, but it is next month and you're obviously a very high profile uh, female business leader, um, um, also a, 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 a black business leader. Um, what is expected of you? What expectations maybe do you put on yourself? Um, and how do you approach being a role model, which obviously you are to so many? 
Um, I mean, I always find it very difficult to know how to respond. <laughs> um, because on the, on the one hand, I have been sort of extraordinarily lucky because I've had this a very bizarre career of um, lots of lots of different roles in the in the public sector then a regulator now uh, in business and feeling you know unbelievably uh, privileged um, at the same time I never think about myself as um, a role model and even the fact that it's a debate feels to me as though we've still got so much progress to make because it's you know, I shouldn't be unusual. Um, it's, sh you know, it sh there shouldn't be a sort of moniker, which is a female business leader or a black person doing a role. And I think, um, I mean, and what I get excited by is that there'll be a point at which this is not remarked, remarkable or indeed remarked on, because actually we're just all um, doing a great job regardless of background and indeed our background is an advantage to the roles that we are that we are doing so i um i um yeah i'm kind of looking forward to a day when um <laughs> you know maybe for my kids um that it's it's just not it's just not an issue mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's not talked about but we were earlier today we were um talking with a number of people and with the countess of wessex around what progress are we really making, mm -hmm. um, whether it's gender equality or whether it's, um, um, you know, uh, uh, more ethnically diverse business leaders um, um, or uh, people from uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the reality is we're not going fast enough, right? So I know, I hear you, you, you know, you are looking forward for the day when that's not an issue because it, you just are a leader and but we're still some way away from that. Um, in fact, you know, it's headline news when one FTSE 100 company yeah. has a female chair, a female CEO, yeah. and a female yes. CFO. Seven, seven trends, right? Certainly it's news. Um, so it's a big thing. Mm -hmm. So what do we need to do to make more progress so that it isn't um, exceptional? In your view, what should we be doing? Yeah, I... Um I mean, I always think from a sort of very personal point of view, the most, Im so the most important thing I can do is to run a great business really well, because then that success and the success of your people and the success of your teams um, uh, kind of speaks for itself. And it's part of the kind of normalization of women being in roles where it hasn't been normal. I think events like this, I think what the CMI is doing is fantastically important. So I'm part of a kind of informal, um, network of female CEOs and we kind of basically meet to laugh and cry every sort of two or three months. Um, uh, women from the banking sector, some women from the media, retail. And actually that group and some of us have been, uh, some of them have been incredibly successful. Others have been in a really, have had a very, very difficult time over the last 18 months. And there is something about the sort of the solidarity and creating networks where you're not necessarily part of the mainstream, which is both shoring, shoring you up, but also the debates we have about talent that's coming through, the, the people that we're spotting, um, but also how you buoy up, um, particularly women in very high profile jobs where um, it has to be said, some of the kind of external commentary can be um, uh, rather, rather different as compared to your male counterpart. So I think doing your job brilliantly, I think um, the networks and the work of CMI, but I think women supporting other women is, um, is incredibly important. Absolutely. So uh, making and also making sure not, not only that peer support, but extending down the ladder and pulling others up. And, um, um, and, and actually, I want to um, ask you this. We're going to take some audience questions as well. But uh, this came up earlier in our discussion. I'd love to know your views on this. So we were talking about the new world of hybrid working. Um, and there are businesses, and yours is one, where you do have people that can work in a hybrid manner. But equally, you have people that actually mm -hmm. have to go into the shops to serve the customers. And um, so how do you approach this and what are your, what have you found post pandemic? Because then some people are concerned, well, it's, it's mostly the, the senior men that are saying back in the office all the time, but others may not want to. 
and what about those that can't work remotely? So what are your thoughts on this new hybrid world? Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah, I mean, I just talk to lots of business people who kind of privately say, gosh, I just want everybody to back, be back in the office five days a week so I can see where they are and kind of measure their productivity. That's not where we are. Obviously, you know, we have 80,000 partners of whom, you know, the vast majority are working in shops and distribution centres and warehouses. So it's not... Um, there's less flexibility, but we're still trying to induce enough flexibility so that, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to work school hours and pick up your kids, we try to be as accommodating as we can. And then those who are um, in, we don't call it head office, but our sort of central teams, um, we're continuing to be very positive about hybrid working. And I think like lots of other businesses, we've sort of settled it about three days a week and Monday and Fridays are like a ghost town in the office, but um, you know, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays are, are vibrant. And I think, I think it's a real positive because I think, again, when it comes to inclusion, when it comes to, again, particularly for women, but, but men too, who've got caring responsibilities who might have uh, needed to pause their career or pause the sorts of jobs uh, they might have done in the past, actually being able to do the school run or to you know, look after parents mm -hmm. um, a couple of days a week or to be able to afford a house that's not in central London, I think I'm really positive. I think those are fantastic opportunities. So I am, you know, I'm not somebody who is sort of desperately looking to return to pre-pandemic ways of work. And I think it's a, it's a real, really positive and very progressive. Yes, well, we certainly agree with you, and there is evidence to suggest that that is the case, that actually productivity does improve. Um, and what do you make, because this came up today as well, of the organizations that do, you know, use technology to spy on their remote workers, like, you know, how many times their fingers hit the keypads? I was say, our technology at the partnership is probably so antiquated that the <laughs> idea that we'd ever be able to... I mean, it's just bizarre. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think we would agree with you, but there are employers out there that are doing it. And, and by the way, the, uh, you know, people always find ways around these things. They just put their, apparently they put their coffee mug on the keyboard. So it looks like they're <laughs> always pressing the key. Um, <laughs> so that, so we won't be, we won't be seeing that at John. I, 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 I don't, I don't think, I suspect they're not going to hang on to their employees for very, uh, for, for too long. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm sure you're probably right on that. Um, but you don't, you said most people are back Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays, but you, as the, as the, the chair, the boss, do you set a rule? Like, yeah. everybody has to do yeah. this. So it's a, a partnership, the partnership's not a very rule set, <laughs> rule set in <laughs> business. Um, so we've said hybrid, we've said flexibility, and it's for every local team to decide. And as I say, broadly speaking, we've kind of, we've kind of ended up with a very sort of um, peaky um, middle of the week. And it, I think it's generally working well. Okay, so you devolve that to the line manager, which is another thing that we heard today, that that's very important. Yeah, so if you're, you know, if you're in a creative team, and we, we're just um, looking at our autumn collections, for example, in John Lewis, um, autumn collections for this year. Actually, you want to be in with your team and feeling the product and the materials. Um, but actually, people are doing trading meetings online on Mondays. And so I think, you know, we, we hire lots of brilliant people. So we trust them uh, to figure out a routine that's going to work brilliantly for them. Mm -hmm. And um, well, it's good that you don't do edicts. We were talking earlier that um, they usually don't work. And there have been a number of CEOs that have said, everybody back to the office and the uh, people working there have said nah. i don't think so <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then they have to back off so by devolving that and by not issuing you've said it's not a very edict based um uh, uh, organization and we know that but uh, it, so that's not you you would agree that that's not a particularly effective strategy well i mean i'm sort of i've been kind of fascinated to see particularly some of the i guess some of the tech companies you've got very big differences facebook where um actually they've been very internationally mobile you've got other companies apple and so on the american banks as you say every company that has tried to get people back full-time five days a week I think you're just you're just going to see talent loss. Yeah, I, I think I think um, certainly we agree with you, and 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 that's what employees tell us as well, and I think that's what managers tell us as well, people, right? People want the choice. Yeah, they do want the choice, so it's hard to put that genie back in the bottle. Um, 
So, okay, we are going to take some audience questions. Um, but before we do, uh, I would like your thoughts. We've been talking a lot about skills mm -hmm. and the, um, the role of, for example, apprenticeships and skills. Um, but as an employer, what do you think we need to do? It's a shame Jillian's gone, but never mind. We'll tell her what you said. Um, uh, what do you think we need to do to improve skills? What should employers do? What would you like to see the government and, and the schools do? What's your recipe for success? Yeah, I mean, for I, growth. Yeah, I mean, I tend to be sort of very. Um, it's a shame Jillian's not here. I mean, I'm. Uh, quite down on how the school system sounds like you're sort of agreeing i'm kind of there yeah i think mm -hmm. i think um i think so many really talented children are put off and have their confidence undermined by the narrowness and the rigidity of the school system and i think that's a I mean, it's why degree apprenticeships are so fantastic because it's partly acting as such an enormous corrective to some of the deficiencies within our school system. Yes, you're right. And I know at CMI we did some work that shows that a lot of graduates don't have those soft skills, university graduates, which, which you know, we're trying to correct. Do you see that as an employer? Sometimes you have to train them in these soft skills? Yeah, no, I mean, very, very much so. So for us, um, I mean, we're almost providing a kind of, like I'm sure lots of businesses, a kind of quasi-school um, re kind of re-education for lots of, lots of kids who either didn't get on with the school system or the school system just has not provided them with um, all the skills they need to do a structured job that's, that's very closely related, related to other people. Yeah, no, I, well, we couldn't agree more at CMI. We know that those interpersonal skills are vital. Actually, uh, they account for, um, according to the experts, and uh, about half the UK's productivity gap is down to management and leadership skills. And you're saying that, that you kind of agree with that. And at the moment, you think the employer is left holding that burden when actually you think that the educational system should absorb more. I think there's a, there's a closer partnership to be made with a more flexible education system. Yeah, and we completely agree with that. Um, well, now, thank you. We are going to have time for some questions. I believe we've been taking questions remotely and from um, the audience. I'm going to turn to my colleagues who are going to produce said questions. Oh, indeed. <laughs> Thanks very much, Anne. Um, the first question, uh, we've brought some of the ones that came on uh, virtually and from people in the room. So uh, the first one's from Janet Rowson. How can apprenticeship employers and providers get more women engaging with digital and engineering apprenticeships? Oh, this is a brilliant question. Um, so we, I mean, I'm sure like lots of businesses, we have, um, found it really difficult to recruit for um, data and analytical skills. So we've set up our own um, <coughs> apprenticeship for those skills. So we've got um, you know, partners who've been on the shop floor who are now retraining as uh, data analysts, data specialists. And so I think my encouragement would be, and maybe we can join up um, to connect with some other businesses who are interested in this, but I think taking that creativity to design um, your own program uh, where, where the market is, 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 is very difficult, but we found it's been hugely, hugely positive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we've had a question from Sally Penny uh, asking, what effect do you see the cost of living crisis having on social mobility? Will social mobility become a nice to have during an economic downturn? Or do you see companies like John Lewis Partnership carrying on the momentum? Um, it's another great question. So, um, I, I mean, I'm probably more worried by the macro, um, the kind of economic situation that I have been for a very long time. And I think, although a lot of the debate at the moment is that inflation's falling, actually we know that for um, lots of families and people who are already struggling, um, um, some things are going to get harder. Energy bills because of what's happening with the price cap, for example due to increase by another 20%. So for, so for, so for families who are from um, less uh, advantaged backgrounds, it's going, to feel, it's going to feel really tough. I guess the question is whether businesses who have been um, supporting um, uh, um, kind of progression and social mobility will, will feel that's a sort of nice to have and, and, um, and, and cut back. 
certainly from the John Lewis partnership, we, we will continue to be as um, you know, focused as we've, as we've been over the last few years, it, particularly, as I say, with this sort of initiative for young people leaving the care system. At the same time, every business is, is going to be restructuring and there are going to be some very, I'm sure, very difficult decisions because every business has got to get their costs down. So the question is, how do we ensure that as we restructure to you know, retain our sort of commercial um, viability and commercial success, we're still doing those great things that are purpose-led, that are pro-social mobility, which is both getting the talent through, but also connecting with our customers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next question, James Stewart, who was asking, how do you make apprenticeships more accessible to minority, minority ethnic community, communities where they just don't see apprentices, apprenticeships um, on the same par as a university degree in particular? How do you, how do you reach those people with the message yeah, about apprenticeships? Another, another great question. I think um, it's probably a particularly acute for um, for people from minority backgrounds, but I think there's still a broader issue, even with degree apprenticeships, that there's, there's still not um, parity, mm -hmm. or there's still not apparent parity with um, a kind of classic mainstream degree. I mean, as we've seen today with the previous panel, there are so much of this is having role models. I mean, I thought your story is fantastic. I, don't want to, I didn't want to go to university at 18, but look at the story you now have. And I think finding ways where um, uh, people who've been incredibly successful having done a degree apprenticeship can then go back into schools and communities and kind of really proselytize and evangelize, I suspect as much to the parents <laughs> as to the, um, as to the, um, as to the students. I mean, my younger son, who is um, thinking about doing a degree apprenticeship himself, and actually he's, you know, trying to get information from the schools has been, they, they just, it's just not something that they are yet um, really clear about. So I think Julian talking about yeah. the fact that um, uh, UCAS will start to have some of this information readily available. But I think those who've, who've been incredibly successful go back into the community, go back into schools and, you know, explain that you're doing brilliantly better than some of your peers who've been who've been to straight university absolutely so um yeah Paige sort of comparing her progress with her friends who did the university yes. without the apprenticeship um, and i think that's a really important point um and and you're right now jillian uh, did tell us ucas is going to list all apprenticeships so, so bravo but what you're saying is career centers in schools need to encourage kids and Paige was saying that her school thought she was crazy. I think that's the word you used, Paige. <laughs> um, so we have some way to go on that. Perfect. Uh, Philippa Jones asks, how do you support more women into senior management posts? There are still very few women in senior or executive roles across all sectors. Yeah, so firstly, you have to start trying to get your own house in order. Um, so our board is majority female, our ex-co is majority female, um, and indeed the business is majority f female. Um, uh, and if we've got about 50-50 in our leadership roles. We do much less well in terms of um, ethnicity, and that's the kind of next kind of big um, area for us to make huge progress. So firstly, doing everything we can within, within our business, but then also how, how we then you know, properly connecting with, with other businesses where yes, there's been huge progress, but it's been huge progress mostly at non-executive level and not at exec level. So, as you say, uh, uh, the number of chief executives, the number of CFOs, the number of exec positions on boards is still really, really low. And I think, um, uh, I think the sort of engagement with shareholders and investors and you know, getting the data available that um, female-led businesses are, are doing really well commercially, but also engaging with their customers and creating mm. lifetime value for customers in a way that's incredibly strong and, um, and incredibly positive. So more to do, mm. more to do, but recognize the progress, um, even over the last sort of 10, 15 years too. 
Thanks very much. The next one's from Jerry Affor, and it's very, very timely. Um, what do you think is the way forward for apprenticeship programs uh, in organizations that are increasingly fast-paced um, and one's under pressure? And he notes the NHS, where staff are under so much pressure. How do they find the time to mentor and develop apprentices? Yeah, and it's and it's and it's tough. I don't think there's a. I don't know if you're in the audience. I don't think there's a, there's a straightforward. Um, answer to that. So whether you're in the public sector at the moment under huge pressure um, with everything that's happened over the last two years, whether you're in um, business, which again, many, many businesses now massively restructuring. But I think um, the best led enterprises, be they public or private, as Anne was saying, you're constantly focused on talent. And so if you're not prioritising skills, if you're not prioritising um, those who are coming through the organisation, if you're not prioritising the coaching and the mentoring, you're going to find in two, three years time that, that you're in a really, really very difficult and very dark place. So although it feels like a very trite thing to say, actually, you've got to prioritise, actually, you've got to prioritise. And you'll find that, you know, the best execs are spending 50% of their time on talent, on their leadership, on, on seeking new talent into the organisation. So I think we've just got to um, keep relentlessly focused on this. Mm. Uh, thank you. Uh, Rachel Oddy asks, how can we encourage employers to value the off-the-job training aspect of apprenticeships, uh, especially management apprentices? Yes, that's a, <laughs> it's always a hard one when they, you know, when you don't see the, for, for a manager who doesn't necessarily see the sort of direct benefits. I think um, certainly we have um, hugely valued when um, the off the job training, when, when our partners come back, actually you can really see the difference. And so I think it's really about how do we also train our managers to take a much more kind of holistic and rounded view. So you might not see the benefit yourself directly, but actually for the organisation in terms of retention, later progression, it's really critical. Um, so I do think it's about how we also tra train our managers and train our leaders to look at skills in a, in a much broader and, and longer term fashion. So it's one of the things you just said about good leaders spend half their time on talent. And that means actually encouraging your team to go on training, right? And then encouraging them to apply it when they return, right? It, exactly. You know, so integrate it into what you're doing instead of, you know, oh, you went on that one day course, now get back to work. Yeah. And I also think, you know, the easiest thing when, when times are tough is to, is to cut the training budget. And the worst thing to do when times are tough is to cut your training budget. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a, you know, it takes you forever to recover from that. Mm, good point. I think we have time for one more just because it's a really good one. <laughs> um, this one comes from uh, Andrea Littlewood. What best piece of advice have you received and um, how have you implemented it in your career? Best piece of advice I've received was probably um, kind of to, to follow your instincts and to have fun. Ooh. So I am, um, um, I mean, I'm the worst person in terms of giving career advice because um, I always think what's the most, you know, we, it's a long life. And, um, and we've all in this room got so many opportunities and so many choices to, um, I don't know, to do, to do good, to make a difference but also um, having fun and being able to get out of bed every morning and think, actually, I'm working with a great team of people. Um, uh, we're doing great work together, but actually it's a really congenial work atmosphere. So probably the people who advise me to kind of, you know, go down particular career paths um, have been less useful than actually just have fun. And probably the other thing is always, always be careful who you work for. So in the days before I became chairman, that, that relationship you have with your people manager, your line manager, um, so, so, so critical. And certainly during the period of my career when I had um, very young children, um, that relationship was really, really critical, working with somebody who was, um, 
kind of super progressive and super flexible made a, made a huge difference. But yeah, definitely have fun has probably been the piece of advice that has, has stuck with me all these years. So that's quite amazing. Um, you ended with a huge plug for CMI, which is, uh, it's all about your line manager. Uh, we are about <laughs> building better line managers who understand how to let people follow their instincts, have fun, develop them into tomorrow's leaders. Um, Dame Sharon, thank you so much. Our time is up. Um, join me, please, in a warm round of applause. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. I hope you enjoyed the warmth, authenticity, and wisdom of Dame Sharon White. Tune in again shortly for the next episode of The Leading Issue. And don't forget to sign up for our CMI Women's Conference coming May 16th. Thank you again.